Our guest is Guido Jose Maria de Tella, Ambassador of the Argentine Republic to the United States. His subject is Argentina's turnaround, its political and economic transformation, and its relations with the United States. Ambassador de Tella was born in Buenos Aires. He received a degree in industrial engineering from the University of Buenos Aires and later earned his PhD from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. During his long and varied career, he has been an associate member of St. Anthony's College, Oxford, as well as professor of economics at both Catholic University in Buenos Aires and the University of Buenos Aires. He has also served as president of the National Fund for the Arts in Argentina, as well as Secretary of State for Coordination and Economic Programming. In 1988 and 1989, he was National Congressman for the Justicialista Party for the province of Buenos Aires and was appointed Argentine Ambassador to the United States last year. He is also the author of several books and publications. You may recall that a previous ambassador from Argentina Lucio Garcia del Solar was our guest at the Council about seven years ago. Much has transpired in Argentina since then, and so it is a great pleasure to have this evening's guest to provide us all with an update. Will you join me in welcoming then Ambassador Guido Jose Maria de Tella? I want to make some comments on some events that are taking place in my country that uh, are actually part of a more general pattern that's taking place in the whole of Latin America, which in a way is also part of a worldwide transformation. Of this worldwide transformation, the part uh, that uh, you talk more about is what's going on in the Eastern European countries. And that has impressed the American mind very much, and I think it's fully justified. Uh, <clears throat> what's going on there, to some extent, is the same thing that's going on in Latin America and in my country. Their <clears throat> turnaround has been much more dramatic because they were much worse off than we were ever, ever were. Uh, they didn't have uh, a political system to speak of. They didn't have political parties. They didn't have a market economy at all. They didn't have an entrepreneurial class. Uh, they were cut off from, from the world, a really isolationist block in the world. <clears throat> Unfortunately for us, for, uh, we did have something of all these things. I say unfortunately because then the turnaround is less dramatic. We did have and we do have political parties in Latin America for, for many years. In some countries, not for so many years. In some other countries, for 30 years, 40 years. The, the party that uh, is in government in Argentina was founded 50 years ago. The opposition party, 100 years ago. Maybe there, are, there, are, there aren't very good parties. I will humbly acknowledge that my party isn't a, isn't a great party. Uh, but uh, has been there in existence and it's working, there has been contributions, made many mistakes as well. We have a, a very frail uh, entrepreneurial class, but still we do have the makings of uh, uh, a, a vital sector of our society. We have institutions, uh, we have an independent judicial system, uh, you may say, I'm, not, I'm just forgetting about the, the military and the military coups. No, I'm not forgetting that. And I would like to explain why we, have, we had those military coups in the past. Uh, but the military have, have not been part of the power structure all the time. They have been at times been in power and at times have been off. Uh, we, in general, in Latin America, we followed isolationist patterns. Uh, economic isolationism, inward-looking strategies, 
we didn't take full advantage of the world trade boom of the 60s and, 70s, and early 70s. Uh, but we were not cut off completely from the world and from the, and from the world economy. Still, what has to be acknowledged is that, generally speaking, we were, to some extent, and some countries to a very significant extent, extent and my country was one case of, of, of that, very inward looking, very inward looking, we thought that we could have a different uh, pattern of development. Uh, the third way, not the first world, not the second world, a third world sort of strategy. Um, we had a distant relationship with the US. In Latin America, you know very well that the name of the game for many years, many decades, was how to irk the Americans a bit. Because even in our, in our more nationalistic moods, we always realized that if you got angry, very angry, that was very bad. But a little bit so that we could make political hay locally. That is not the name of the game anymore. Now the name of the game is, if you want to make political hay locally, is to try to show that we can get along with you, we can understand the Americans, and we can take, take advantage of this new relationship. <clears throat> Now, all Latin American countries were in this inward-looking third world sort of strategy in the 60s, nearly all. Uh, lots of state intervention, uh, lots of regulations, uh, was a sort of mercantilist mood or stage that we went through, a very long one. And certainly Argentina is one, is one of the more intense cases. But as in the Eastern European countries, the state-run economy, or even a half-state-run economy, proved to be a dismal failure. Originally, because one has to understand how this came about, uh, there was, uh, I mean, just after the war, and I think lo with lots of influence from the mood, the early post-war uh, period, that the state could benefit the poor that the benefit could, could promote growth, promote industries that were non-existent, that the protection was good, uh, that uh, the world was a bit dangerous and that we could uh, uh, develop w with our own resources. That was a bit the, the mood the, of the early post-war period. Um, as time went by, one began to realize that this uh, intervention by the state was uh, not very good, then not good at all, and then very bad. Because a little bit of something may be good, but a lot of something can be very bad. So some, some growth of the role of the state was inevitable, particularly in view of the very low role of the state of the 30s, but it was inevitable that if this went on too far, the reaction would be, uh, uh, would be very bad. Well, the state was, in a way, the benevolent state. That was the image that we had in the, uh, in the, in the 40s. Uh, then in the 60s, one began to realize that the state was the victim of the pressure of the lobbies and instead uh, and began to, uh, to yield to these pressures, give subsidies to, 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 uh, to, the, to, to the business groups, that the competition was not uh, required uh, and then we had the beginning of a decadence, an economic, uh, dec economic decline. Um, probably we never were, were so bad, we never reached the dismal uh, situation of the Eastern European countries. But even half of that mess is a very big mess in any case. Um, and the situation, I mean, we, which uh, we have, uh, we, we reached uh, in the last decade, uh, provoked a real a revolt against the state and against that situation. Uh, this little game played in the U.S. Latin American relation proved to be so silly, so silly. Uh, and we tended to say, I remember in the 60s, when some of the countries that were joining the Western alliance began to do so well. We found exceptions, we found reasons. We said, well, okay, Italy is a special case because it's a post-war Marshall Plan. 
Then Spain joined the Western world and did very well. Said, well but that is a special case because they, they have the, uh, the, the pool of the common market. Then we say, well, then Japan, but that's a spe very special case, the, the strategic interest of the U.S. And then uh, Taiwan, and then Korea, and then, and then Singapore, and then you name it, and every single country that joined the Western alliance has done very, very well. Finally, we decided that if all these were special cases, we could as well uh, be one <laughs> a special case ourselves. <laughs> and then maybe this was part of a pattern. Now, at the very end, at the very end, what we have decided to do is to end an iso isolationist stage of our history. We were not, we were not born isolationist. Um, although we broke with, with a European country that was our, <laughs> that colonized our country. I mean, we were not isolationists. Uh, and w at the beginning of the century, we were very open, very open with, uh, with foreign investment, with foreign capital. We had a very special connection with Britain. And we understood the world very well through this special uh, association with Britain. When, this, we, when we were cut off from this uh, relationship, basically because of uh, the decline of Britain, we were uh, at a loss. We didn't uh, dare to join the American uh, alliance uh, and we, we found, when people are a bit uh, afraid, that's a typical reaction, we looked inward. And we, we tried to develop uh, this third world alternative. Now, to have a third world uh, view, when, the sec when, the, when you have a first world that's doing very, very well, a second world that is collapsing and has disappeared, to be third of a second situation that is non-existent anymore is a very pitiful situation. I even in our inward looking mood, we were aware that this could not go on. Now, the change has been very, very drastic because what we have been doing, and now I, I, I speak specifically of Argentina, we decided uh, regarding our international uh, uh, um, um, uh, relation, we decided to make the alliance with the US the center. And we want it just to be a member of the Western Alliance, and in the case of, of the Americas, led by the US. Now, this is not in the Latin American tradition. But I mean, it took maybe 50 years to find out that we are part of the Americas and that the US is a la rather large and important country. We weren't very quick in concluding uh, this, but we made it. We made it, and now we found that really that relation is the essence of our future prosperity. You may know, and if not, uh, I will mention and brag about, that we, sent, we just sent two frigates to the Gulf. Uh, this, for, for, for a Latin American country, is a very, uh, a, a very different behavior. And actually, I can assure you that we didn't send these frigates with the belief that we were changing the balance of power in the Gulf. Because not in this new mood, we are aware <laughs> that, that, uh, that even cooper cooperation has a limit. But it's a symbol. It's a symbol of our allegiance to the West and our desire to be a member of the Western Club. Because the Western Club is a great club and it's doing very well. Now, you say, you're doing very well, you have a, maybe a recession or whatnot. But when you speak of a recession, you really do not use the word that has to be used. Because a recession for you is because you are not going to grow. Maybe GDP will be 1%, half a percent, minus one. That will be a disaster. But in our countries, we have seen our, our GDP decline by 5%, 10%. Industry going, I mean, producing half of what it used, it used to produce. So, I mean, your problems, which you do have, and for you is very serious, and for the leader of the world are serious problems, are non-existent. I mean, I cannot... Uh, uh, be worried about your problem, really. <laughs> I cannot. I cannot. I think of mine and, and yours are, are, are non-existent. It's just in your minds. It isn't exactly in your minds, but in any case, uh, it's a different order of magnitude, really. Um, regarding uh, the role of the state, I mean, we do not mismanage. Mismanage will, will be a compliment uh, of what we do with, with our public enterprises. <laughs> 
uh, more horrible maybe some dirty word should be used I mean to describe the way we, we mismanage really now a little bit of mismanagement can be accepted or maybe society accepts unfortunately our society did accept some decline but I mean we have reached a situation where really is uh, I mean there is a revolt uh, of the people against the kind of uh, 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 services provided by the state, uh, social services which are dismal. I mean, this was not the situation of our country in the past. It's the situation of our country today. And now everybody, and I would say upper class people, middle class people, low class people, everybody has revolted against the state. The consequence of that is that we have a privatization scheme that includes not some enterprises, the whole lot. You want to buy, I mean, uh, an enterprise, you name it, we'll sell it. So you just, I mean, I hope that you can give me a list of the ones you want, we want to sell them. We are selling uh, three main enterprises, I hope this week, actually. It's the eighth. Tomorrow, 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 tomorrow. It's the, national, the two national telephone companies plus the, the, the airline, national airline. But in the 60s, the national airline was Sovereignty itself was the essence of, uh, I don't know, of the Argentinidad that was there be, behind the, 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 the airline and, the, and, and, the, and, the, and supposedly carrying the flag. But I mean, one can carry the flag in a less expensive way. I mean, we can carry it by courier and much cheaper than just own. Uh, and this has been sold. Um, and now that we have a very, very, very uh, uh, a long list of the major companies, including YPF. YPF is our national oil company. So all this myth of the 60s, or the 40s, 50s, 60s, had been demolished. You could say, well, but uh, I mean, here is Ambassador bragging about being normal. Well, actually, I am bragging about being normal because you have lost sensitivity to how expensive and difficult it is to be normal and to behave in a normal way. When I, I presented my uh, letter of credential to President Bush, we had uh, not a very long chat, but a very nice chat. And when I was saying goodbye, I said to President Bush, President Bush, just to, to rem so you remember what we discussed, uh, we have so many other things you may forget, but remember that after 50 years, Argentina has decided to become normal. That's the great news, that's the great news. Now, it isn't, I mean, to be normal is to have an independent judiciary, to have the, the, the role of the state limited to very few things, but very important, but very few things. Uh, to have uh, an entrepreneurial class that you are not hindering, that you just allow, allow the entrepreneurial, ha entrepreneurial has, uh, class to do whatever they want. We don't have priorities anymore. We don't want to have priorities. Invest wherever you want, wherever you make a profit. But all these things are not that easy. Well, now in this country, probably, I mean, you, you lose the meaning of what normalcy is and the big effort and the big achievement of the Western world. The Western world is a new. I mean, there, there are societies in the West that have become normal since the war, since the Second World War. I mean, the West has not been normal for the last 100 years. There have been tremendous anomalies in the Western world over the, over, over the, or, uh, in the last 100 years, in the last 50 years. I mean, uh, Spain that now teaches us lots of lessons that we have to heed, certainly, but they were very abnormal up to very, uh, up, not, not so, so, so far away. And I will, I will not delve on that because I have to remember that I'm a diplomat. <laughs> but uh, a political appointee, therefore, I, I'm not aware of the limits of what the things I can say or not. But uh, okay, I mean, any, any society does have these problems. Um, I think that we are be just beginning the process. This turnaround has taken place. Now uh, it is uh, advocated by everybody. The great opponents of the turnaround was my party. I mean, and by the fact that my party, which is a labor-based party, is a party based on the poor, on the vote of the poor, has, has, uh, is advocating these policies, we have fi finished the discussion on these issues. 
It isn't just that an upper class party supported by the Americans or, a, or an upper class uh, society with a dictatorship supported or maybe with some leniency from the US uh, is imposing against the will of a country uh, these policies. It is the country itself. And it isn't that my president is uh, the great man that, that thought on, uh, in his head all these things. It's something that the society has put pressure, insisted that, the, that we could not accept the decline. I think that the change will take maybe 10 years, not one or two, 10 years. I think the Eastern European countries are beginning a process that will take 20 or 30 years. And if in 20 or 30 years the Soviet Union, or the Soviet disunion, as you want, as you want to call it, uh, ends up uh, in a normal way, they become normal, that would be great in 20, 30 years. I think that uh, we went through this stage maybe a year ago, when in this country you were very excited about the Eastern European countries. We were very jealous, really. I mean, you were very excited because, I mean, they were so bad off and they were changing and doing extraordinary things. And at times, I think you had the impression that things would go well in the Eastern European countries very soon. Even in the country that probably has the best expectation, which are the, 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 is Germany, that solved its problems through unconditional surrender, which is not something that, that all countries can have. I mean, not, not, a, not a country can, can choose uh, a victor in, in, in a conflict that easy. Uh, but the other countries, I think, even, even, even uh, Germany will, will go through lots of strains, but I think that will be solved rather, easy, rather quickly, in a way. But the other Eastern European countries, I think, are for, 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 a long pull, for a long pull. I think they will come up uh, very well. And I think we are halfway. We started much earlier. We never were that, that bad. And I think that the turnaround is not less intense. And this is a great achievement. And this is what I want to brag about in front of you tonight. Thank you. Mr. Ambassador, we thank you for a most interesting uh, set of comments. The floor is now open for questions. The question concerns your rate of inflation. What is it? And I presume. Uh, uh, the question is to comment on, on it as well. Our rate of inflation is very, very low. It's only about 4% per month. <laughs> in July of last year, it was 200% when the government came in. In uh, February, it was 100% per month. Then went from March on to 15% per month, and now it's 4% per month. In a way, the present rate of inflation is a disaster. That's the truth. But the previous one was a greater disaster. <laughs> Why we have this, uh, this situation? I think and now we understand the situation very, very, very well. Uh, we have very little money in circulation because people avoid holding money, so the monetization of the economy is very low. Any fiscal deficit has an explosive impact on inflation, an explosive. And the fiscal deficit was not under control. Now, to have the fiscal deficit under control is very difficult, including in this country, may I say. Now, you can finance the deficit very easily, yet. And yet, the yet may be for 20, 30 years. You cannot go on for 400 years this way. But I mean, the fiscal, a fiscal equilibrium is, means a social equilibrium, a, a, a pre-existing social equilibrium. And after all, I think that the discussion that we had in these last weeks ended up in a very positive way. I mean, I mean, everybody is aware that you do have a problem and you, you do have to tackle. Now, we are reminded of, of the need to tackle the fiscal deficit because every time we depart from an orthodox equilibrium, we end up with hyperinflation. In a way, in a way, the fact that we had twice, two hyperinflation bouts were very good for Argentina. They were very educational. Now, you may say, I do not recommend this uh, as, uh, in, in the curriculum of anybody, you know, but uh, at times societies need to see 
the danger to react. It would be much better not to, ha to, not to have the danger and not to, ha to have needed uh, such a dangerous situation. Bolivia did went through that situation, Chile did went through that situation, and Argentina did, went, did go through that situation. And we all reacted, finally. And we put uh, common sense into the, society, in, into the economy and, and into society. And that is a great, a great advantage. Nobody now in Argentina would argue that the fiscal equilibrium is not a must. And if we don't have it, for the next month we do have a, 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 an inflationary or a hyperinflationary re, 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 rebound. If I heard the question correctly, it is what is your country's attitude toward uh, ownership of these uh, companies that are now presently being sold? Is that correct? Foreign, foreign, foreign ownership foreign, yeah. of Argentine companies. We make no difference whatsoever between foreign and local ownership. I'll tell you more. Uh, if in some of these great uh, privatizations, uh, it would be bought by a local group, it would be immediately be suspect. Because we doubt that in this great, uh, these largest companies, we do have local entrepreneurs with enough capital. Because the, 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 the typical reaction now would be that if a local uh, group, which is much smaller than what is required for the purchase of these enterprises, purchases the enterprises because there is uh, some sort of subsidy implicit in the sale. Uh, what has happened, but not, not as a requirement of the government, that there has been an association between international companies and some local companies. But this is not, neither required, not even desired. We make no difference. We have changed our foreign investment law, and now there's none. There's none. So when, when people come and say, well, but what's, the, what's the priority? Where do you want us to invest? Where you make money? That's the answer. Choose the, choose the area. If you choose right, you are going to make lots of, lots of money, which is what we want you make. Because if you make lots of money, then you will invest more. But we make no difference whatsoever, and the official policy is not to make diff any difference. And that is the feeling and the mood in the country. It's not just that the government is doing that. Of course, we do have some people, but very few people, who complain a bit, and not much about that. What were the main causes and consequences of the war in the Falkland Islands? Look, there are two levels here, and the answer, I will give it in two levels. First, uh, we do have a claim, a sovereignty claim. We think we are right, and we're going to continue that claim first. Second answer, the war on our side was the consequence of utter frustration and not on the matter of the islands. Two years before, the military nearly invaded Chile. And we nearly had a war with Chile, not a minor event. Then we had this war. Now, this is the extreme consequence of utter frustration, extreme isolationism. What is the consequence of that? This, I mean, one year before, we thought that we had a military rule for the next 20 years. Well, the military rule collapsed. And I think that the, this has brought about a complete change within the military. The, the military are now are the ones, or one of the groups, that are putting tremendous effort in pushing this good association with the U.S. Because they are aware that isolated, with a third world uh, armament, they will end uh, as a third world or fourth world uh, 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 army, not respected by anybody. And I mean, not to my surprise, but as a consequence of this, I mean, this is a rethinking. I mean, the businessmen that have taken advantages from the state for the last 20, 30 years are rethinking their role because they are aware they, they cannot continue just milking this dry stone anymore. And in a way, I would say that 40 years of isolationism it was, before, it was behind, and the consequence that, that it has been the end of isolationism. I mean, not that I recommend a, a, a defeat to change. Again, this is, this is a, a similar. 
Hyperinflation was beneficial, not because it's desirable in itself, because it is a disaster. The, the consequence was a reaction. This conflict, this really unwarranted conflict, the consequence is that really put an end to isolationism. The question is, uh, how are you going to handle unemployment? What is your rate now, and how are you going to handle it when you, uh, especially in light of your fiscal deficit, when you begin to change the nature of your economy? Well, privatization in the case of the telecommunication company this is not having and will not have a detrimental impact on employment because the company will have to triple its activities in the next five years. So if the company would be stagnant, then there would be maybe half of, half of the employees would be redundant. Given the fact that this will be tripled in the next five years, uh, there will be friction on unemployment because, I mean, some categories maybe will have to go, but other people will come in. So the net result, I think, that will be an increase in employment because of this tremendous upsurge in uh, telecommunication services. Our unemployment uh, in, uh, in Argentina has been traditionally rather low. Now it's increasing. We have about 7% explicit unemployment, and there's a, another 5% of underemployed. We think as a consequence of, of all this turnaround, unemployment will increase. And this will be a very unfortunate part of the turnaround. I cannot say something better than that. And we are trying to prepare the, our, the public opinion to this, which is the most unpalatable part of the new policies. Then eventually, after five, seven years, I mean, employment will increase again on a sound basis. But, the, but basically, one of the reasons of the low unemployment of the past, which was typically four or five percent, was because, I mean, there was employment by the state. And there was a fiscal deficit because of that. And, and that's the vicious circle that we have been through. But that will be a very delicate uh, uh, part of the whole policies. This is the same thing that happened in, 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 in Spain. In Spain is a, is, is a very similar case to the case of Argentina, really. And there, there you have a case that, that, uh, with many similarities, actually. In 1960, every ratio, index, uh, figure, per capita, uh, whatever, you name it, uh, of Spain was worse than any similar figure of Argentina. In 25 years, this has been reversed, and there isn't any single indicator that uh, is uh, better in Argentina than in Spain. So, I mean, a 20-year span can change a society. We're in the beginning of that. I think that in 10 years, this will be very noticeable, but uh, we, w we will be again what we were many years ago, I think in, in, more than, in, in even more than, 20, than 10 years. If you ask me if people are going to have a patience and accept this very long period, I think they will, but this I mean, is wishful thinking. No? I mean, uh, I don't know whether that will be the fact or not. But there isn't alternative policies, and this is another important element. There are, nobody is putting forward an alternative program. But, the, I mean, as everything in life, I mean, this strategy has great advantages, great promise for the future, but do have some cost. I think the alternative program, which hi is hyperinflation and, and, and chaos, economic chaos, has had an even greater cost. Would you comment upon, uh, first, identify the, the size of your country, your population, and secondly, comment, if you will, upon the nature of the health problem and the problems of the poor in Argentina and what your country is doing about that? Well, the population of Argentina is about 35 million. Uh, it's growing about, at about 1% per year. Uh, one of the reasons for the turnaround has been uh, the sort of social services that we are providing or that we are not providing. Um, Argentina was known uh, maybe 40 years ago as one of the countries that had the better income distribution and the better social services, the, uh, education, uh, health. And this has deteriorated, not a little bit, but a tremendous 
to a tremendous extent. Really, the kind of attention you get uh, in a public hospital is dismal. And there is a reaction because of that. And that's the reason why even the poor want a change and will not accept this to continue. There are alternative uh, semi-private uh, uh, um, health systems are not good enough, uh, and they have to be changed. The, the, revo the turnaround has proceeded further ahead in the economic front, let's say uh, production of uh, uh, public, uh, public services, uh, goods, uh, and we are behind in the turnaround in the social front. And that is where the new emphasis will be put uh, very soon. Again, you will not have good social services in a country that uh, is bankrupt and, uh, and has the previous policies. With the change, new, th new avenues will be, will be opened. But a drastic change will not take place in two or three years. But that is, I think, uh, that was really the, uh, the final reason for the reaction of, the, of my party. Because, I mean, when you go to a public hospital, I mean, if you have some money you, and you have a telephone, you are against the state because you cannot get across with the telephone. Yeah. But if you are poor and you go to a public hospital, you are revolted by what happens there. This was not the case before. I mean, it, a country does changes as we are changing for very, very deep reasons. It isn't an intellectual conviction. We're not intellectually convinced of, of, the new, uh, of the new avenues. We have been co convinced by the facts of life, by the terrible facts of life, of what happens when you depart. Look what, what, what appears now every day of what is the sort of production they have in the Eastern European countries, the, the kind of organization they have for health, for anything. It's a, it's a ma major disaster and an unnecessary disaster. Absolutely a necessary disaster. We know that this is not something God-given, was made by ourselves. I mean, we are not blaming anybody. The previous, the previous answer would be the Americans are responsible. I, this is, well, you are responsible for everything that you are aware. But, uh, uh, but now, I mean, and this is something that the, uh, our president insists, this is our own fault. There may be concurring uh, responsibility, but basically it's our own fault. Other countries, similar countries, have not had this problem or have been able to overcome these hurdles. And we will overcome. Would you comment <coughs> upon your government's policy on the human rights questions and specifically comment upon uh, the relationship <coughs> between your government and uh, uh, things that may have been done under the previous military regimes? <coughs> In Latin America, there have been human rights violations of a horrible kind in several countries. The case of Brazil, of Uruguay, Argentina, Chile. Or there are others as well, but I'm mentioning those. In the case of Brazil, they didn't start any sort of trial of any sort. Uh, they were happy enough to get rid of the military uh, and they thought they could not pursue any investigations of any sort. The military that are in Brazil in, uh, in charge today are the continuation of the previous military. There hasn't been a cutoff of any sort. In the case of Uruguay, there was an attempt to try the military. Again, the civilian, the first civilian president, Mr. Sanguinetti, was very concerned that this would end up in a coup. Because it's very difficult to put on trial the whole uh, serving officers of your armed forces. It's utterly unrealistic. There was a, 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 a referendum, and people voted, not by a great margin, but voted in favor of not pursuing uh, 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 military investigations. Not because anybody that was voting in that direction was thinking that what was done, what had been done, was right. But that there was no way out except not forgetting, just, well, leaving the situation as it was. 
In the case of Argentina, the first civilian government of Mitchell Alfonsin uh, started with the trials. They put in jail uh, a group of the, mo the, the principal uh, uh, officers, the principal generals of the, very, of the three juntas and a few others, and they tried a system by which every single member of the armed forces could be put on, in jail. Great. Freedom of justice. So great, well, the idea was that there was a revolt and we nearly ended with a military coup. Because these things have a limit. And are those, so if you just think in the principles and not in reality, not, not how, you, how to implement those principles, then you can make a, a very, a great, very great mistake. There were three pardons, two by the previous administration, that uh, uh, in a way allowed the serving officers not to be uh, tried anymore. What is left now uh, is a group of those that have, had been tried, and probably they will be set free rather soon. Uh, there has been about uh, 13, 14 years since these events have taken place, and uh, the government believes that the page has to be turned. You did not continue with your investigations of everybody af after the Second World War. At times, a page has to be turned. In the case of Chile, not only they have not made any investigation of any sort, but they have the chief culprit, Mr. Pinochet, as commander-in-chief of the armed forces. And I think, and Mr. Elwin, which I think is a great man and a great Democrat, has no intention of prosecuting Mr. Pinochet. The day he does that, there's a coup. Now, you may think that by saying all this, I'm saying that the democracy in the southern cone is frail. My answer would be, it's obvious. Absolutely obvious that it's frail. We have to build and give strength to a frail body that we will not uh, give strength if we pursue utopic and realistic targets. It's a very painful answer that I'm giving to you. But I think it's a very sober uh, answer at the same time. Would you uh, comment on whatever difficulties may be involved in the labor issue in general as you proceed and uh, comment specifically on the possibility of a split within your party? Look, to begin, for a labor-based party, the, the best thing that can happen in your life is to lose an election. Therefore, in the opposition, you dream what you want and then you accuse the government of not doing the right thing. Now, Unfortunately, from time to time, these sort of parties do win. And then you have a problem. <laughs> At times I say that uh, <laughs> in our sort of countries, uh, the, uh, the, the loser in an election should be condemned to govern, not the winner, <laughs> the, the loser. <laughs> but, uh, not, uh, not a very practical idea. <laughs> now, obviously, your, your, your question goes to a dilemma that my party has. The labor movement has been declining in importance for several reasons. First, there's a structural change in the composition of employment. And workers, and blue and blue-collar workers, are now a much smaller proportion of total employment. Uh, the great unions, great at, at, in terms of size, at least, uh, uh, have lost uh, members by half, because there's half the employment in the, in the industry. Moreover, in the 40s and 50s, workers could express themselves in our sort of society through very few channels. One was the, the, the unions. Now, now uh, the workers are not in a ghetto, separated from society, uh, but are just members, now accepted members of society with full rights. And therefore, I mean, they need less, the unions, to represent them. Now, the unions have been aware that with the previous sort of policies, we have ended up with very low wages, with rising unemployment, with inflation, with hyperinflation. And they are also aware that this is not the way in which they, get a ben they have been benefited. Uh, they know how the workers in this country live. 
They know how the workers in Europe live, and they know how they live. And it isn't that easy for them to, to reclaim the old policies at all. Where we have the center of resistance is in some unions that are associated with state companies where there's a horrible overmanning. Uh, in the case of uh, the railroads, there are about 100,000 workers. We have reduced about 10,000, but we have to reduce 70,000 more. You cannot have a friend in that union. Even, the, even in this case where the head of the union, he's a very good friend of mine, is aware of the problem. But he said, well, what do you want me to say? I mean, if you are offering me to reduce 10,000 more, we can discuss. But what you are saying, that we have uh, to reduce nearly 70%. That I cannot uh, manage. Well, I, I told him that time we met, I told him, you have an alternative. We, we may end up getting rid of 100,000 workers and close the railroads. This was, was, was done in, in Uruguay. Because, I mean, railroads are not working at all. We have $700 million of uh, deficit because of the railroads, and we transport only 7% of cargoes. So even, I mean, uh, I mean die-hard union leaders are aware that a certain strategy is dead. There is a dilemma, and the, the consequence of this dilemma is that the social composition of the parties will change. Argentina has had a very neat class association with the parties. The Peronistas, we were the, the, the workers' party, the radicales, the middle class party, and then there was uh, the right wing party, the party of the rich. This is being uh, broken because of the reality of, of being in government. And that's the consequence of alternating in government. Then every party is confronted with the same problems at the end. And at the end of the day, the leeway you have to, to, to opt for different policies is not that great. The question is, do you see uh, increased foreign investment on, as a reaction to your uh, change strategy? We have significant new foreign investments uh, associated with the privatizations. That we do have. We do have requests, not we, I mean the, the uh, American ins insurance. Uh, organization, the OPIC, has had nearly $3 billion of requests of guarantees for investment. Um, not investment that have already taken place, but that will be taking place over the, in the future, because these are, are taken not for immediate expenditure, but uh, to, be, to be invested. It's a program by program uh, insurance. So you have to, to insure the whole lot even if you're going to invest in two, two three, four years. That is a very encouraging element. Um, still, the, the great uh, wave of investment will take more time. There is the beginning of a return uh, of the capital flight of the country. Um, about uh, $3 billion of basically of Argentine uh, money elsewhere has come, come back to the country, creating a very serious problem with exchange, because I mean, there has been over, a tremendous overvaluation of, 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 of the Austral. The, Aust the Austral over the last six months has been a much better in investment than, than, than buying dollars. Um, but I mean, to, to change the investment climate will take uh, several years, I imagine. Would you comment upon the various devices that the government might use to encourage private business? Well, the secret device that we have is to do nothing at all. <laughs> so we try not to hinder with regulations, with requirements, but we will not give subsidies, we will not give, give credit. There's no priority of any sort. Uh, and on this, we're very insistent. And we think that just by eliminating uh, regulations and allowing free movement uh, into the country, outside the country, uh, no exchange controls of any sort, we are going to get, uh, we are going to encourage the, the investors.
The uh, question deals with internal resistance to imports and I assume competition <coughs> in general from the outside. And the question is, does your political party have the will to face that domestic resistance? <coughs> and what kind of timetable do you have for it? Well, we have reduced the import tariffs uh, and now there's a range from, that goes from 5% to 24% with an average of about 15%. We want uh, to increase the lower uh, rates and decrease the upper rates to a standard value of about from, from 10 to 15 percent. But we have done already, I mean, this is, a, this is a tremendous change because before, two years ago, we have been 50 percent, 70 percent sort of import rates. We have some special regimes for special products, for example, for uh, computers. But this has been, the, the, it has been discontinued altogether. Has ended, and there was a phasing out period and ended in, uh, in September. September, October last year. We still have a problem with, with cars. Automobiles do have a special regime that now we try to open up, and then there was a resistance by, by some of these companies, and now we are fighting. Of course there is resistance, but there's a great excitement. We, have, we are reducing tariffs with four countries, Argentina, Brazil, Uruguay, and Paraguay. By the end of 94, we will have zero tariffs between our four countries. We have seen our exports to Brazil in double over the last few months. Uh, and we are very excited about that. Moreover, uh, the Bush initiative that uh, spoke about uh, the free, uh, possible free trade area, we have, taken, we have taken that very seriously. We are trying to sign the beginning of, of a process which is the so-called framework agreement that will, should end up, maybe in a few years, with this free trade area with the U.S. We are so excited about that, that in the discussions with uh, uh, government officials of, uh, of your country, I have the impression that they, are, they think that we have taken President Bush too seriously. Would you comment upon education and how it relates to your uh, economic plans? Well. Argentina was known and is, has been known for many, many years as a leading literacy uh, uh, fight in Latin America. And we have had European rates for the last 20, 30 years. Um, liter literacy is not our problem because I, I think we have reached the target there. But it's a very modest target. Uh, Regarding, I mean, uh, uh, high school education, that has increased tremendously over the last 20 years, tremendously. Universities have increased, university enrollment has increased tremendously, but unfortunately, the quality of education has gone down tremendously. Education has suffered as health has suffered, and we do have a very, very serious problem because a decay in education is something you don't feel next year or five years from now. But I think if we do not revert this situation regarding the quality of education, uh, we will have a problem. And we are aware of that, and we are trying, to, uh, we are trying again to introduce this new, new, new change into education as well. But we do have a very serious problem. It's one of the, I mean, the public services that have decayed very much with the decline of the country. But we are aware that if we don't tackle that problem, we don't have a future in the next century. The question is, will you comment upon your, the uh, uh, policy of the ambassadors? Would you comment upon your government's policy on the question of cocaine and on nuclear weapons? Well, uh, we, are, we are not one of the countries uh, worst hit by this uh, 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 drug problem. Uh, still, we're, we're very worried because at any level is a problem. And as the fight against uh, uh, drugs uh, increase in our neighboring countries, we're afraid that some of these activities may be transferred to our country, as they are being transferred to some extent to Brazil. Uh, we have a very close cooperation with the uh, uh, drug, drug enforcement agency in this country. Uh, there's a complete program that we are following. Uh, it isn't a major problem, but we think we have to put 
fortunately, at this early stage, as much effort as we can. Regarding nuclear uh, proliferation, we are about to sign, and this will be announced any day now, an agreement with Brazil about uh, interchange of information. This is the first step towards the second step, which is the organization uh, of what is called or will be called Latin Atom, which will be a Latin American surveillance system that will allow us to sign the Tlatelolco Treaty in this modified form. Um, we are now, uh, as I say, beginning the first step of a few steps that will end up with this, again, isolationist attitude regarding uh, nuclear weapons. Regarding uh, uh, missiles, we had a great project. Uh, we decided to team up with, I mean, this was a few years ago, with uh, uh, Egypt and Iraq for the building of mis missiles. Uh, I think that the, if one would, would have imagined a program to irritate the Americans, that was the best. <laughs> had top, top marks, and we started, and we, we obtained full results. The missiles were never built, fortunately. That was not the purpose, but we irked the Americans a lot. We have dismissed altogether that program, altogether, and we don't want to do nothing along those lines, not at all. You cannot be a member of the Western world and have those ideas, it's one or the other. You want to play with silly schemes to irritate the uh, leading countries that you, you depend a lot, your prosperity, for these silly schemes, then that, that was a perfect idea. Mr. Ambassador, we thank you very much for spending so much time with us this evening and for being so frank with us, both during your address and in answering the questions. And we're grateful for an evening which has been informative, thoughtful, and enjoyable. Thank you. Thank you.